This is my second it is. podcast. Yeah, you were there at the branding event, yeah, the first one. That was a wild day. Yeah. Well, look how far we've come now. I know. So good of you to join me, listeners. This is Drew Duglin, back with episode 13 of the podcast. And it doesn't get much bigger than today's guest. A returning guest, in fact. I'm chatting with Dr. Eric Topol, the founder and director of the Translational Institute at Scripps Research, who is leading the charge in revolutionizing health with some of the most innovative technologies around. We actually spoke on site during a one-day conference put on by Scripps, which brought together the brightest minds from the worlds of biotech and nonprofits, hence the gentle hum of attendees in the background. So let's get into our discussion. We join Eric as he describes his main role with the inception of the Translational Institute and its core mission. Well, I've been a, a doctor for 40 years, so I've had a little experience. And I came here in 2007, the beginning of that year, to start a new institute. Uh, and the whole effort was dedicated to understanding each human being mm. at a granular level, first with uh, genomics and then with sensors and digital medicine. And so over time, and that's been over 12 years, we've had a really big uh, impact to enhance understanding of each person so we can deliver much more precise, individualized care. Great. And over those 12 years, what kind of progress uh, have you made and what have been the real key contributions to the medical field? Well, I think we quickly became um, a digital medicine leader. Over the years, we've we edit the major journal, Nature Digital Medicine. We, uh, we got a $207 million grant from the NIH to lead the digital portion of the largest medical research program in American history. And we have made lots of contributions. Our, our group went from size of one person to 110 people. And we have um, a very uh, competitive flagship grant of the NIH, which gives us just a great opportunity to innovate to use these tools, now including artificial intelligence and deep learning, to create a, a far better form of healthcare, uh, which is really quite exciting. Yeah, and you brought up artificial intelligence, and I think in some of your work, you uh, have the term high-performance medicine, which is this combination of the human intelligence and the artificial intelligence. So what do you think the role of you know, nonprofits like Scripps and other foundations is in this space going forward, and how can they make the biggest impact? Well, it turns out when you start uh, sequencing a person's genome and also having sensors that collect data every second or minute continuously, you start generating oodles of data, yeah. terabytes of data, and that's uh, beyond any human comprehension. Uh, so that's where you need machines. And that's where you need artificial intelligence. And so what we can contribute now is we have in our group, a superb bioinformatics. Uh, we have people like uh, Ali Tarkamani and uh, Amelio Talenti, Andrew Sue, just a, a superstar group. So they are the ones that can help deal with this data and create the platform for the future of healthcare. Because in the future, we'll know each person's traditional medical records, mm -hmm. but integrated with that will be the sensors they're wearing their genomics, their gut microbiome, and all these other uh, data uh, sources like their environment, which we can quantify now. So we're going to change medicine. That's our mission. And it dovetails beautifully with overall Scripps research, which has been doing that in a largely different way in basic science and in drug discovery. So we, we're very complementary in our efforts to uh, have a broadened perspective and expertise. Yeah, it's so cool for me to see the embrace of the phenotyping as well, because we've we've had for a while this big buzz around genomics, and it's nice to see that you're also going to be collecting the phenotype, because yeah, the environment kind of influences the the gene expression of, of our blueprint. So it's just fantastic to to have the combination of everything. Well, you know, back in the year 2000, there was this simplistic sense that if you could get the DNA mm. cracked of a genome that will know everything and that changes. Well, we, we were really one of the first groups to realize, you know what, that's not going to be enough. We need to have other layers of data. And this deep phenotyping that you're referring to is part of this whole deep medicine, as I call it. So what do you think the best ways are for the nonprofits and then also the for-profit companies and biotech firms to be really collaborating in this area? And do you think there are some really good examples of um, people already doing this and, and harnessing some of these developments in artificial intelligence? 
Well, you know, we like to use the model of both public and private partnerships. So we have, as a nonprofit entity, we have a, a new partnership with NVIDIA, one of the leading AI companies in the world. And we're working with them on as a center of excellence for genomics and biosensors. And so that's an exemplar of what you can do when you take the complementary strengths and talents of two different institutions, one that's for-profit, with probably would be regarded as the leading AI uh, company worldwide now. But then you have these tech titans like Google and Microsoft and Apple and Amazon, yeah. which we work with as well, that are having more of an impact than ever in healthcare. We have to be careful because privacy and security is a big issue. Uh, and we also want to be able to tap into the strengths of these companies, which is they're quite formidable. So we uh, understand the need, the unmet need, because we we look after patients. We, we're we grounded in what's best for the patient. That's the center of everything for us. And the companies that uh, are interested in this space, they obviously have a somewhat different interest. They'd like to help patients, but that's not what makes them tick. And so we, we come at it in different ways, complementary ways. Right. These companies that are working at both the large tech companies and startups are largely engineers with a great innovative capability. And we are more understanding the use case, the ability to uh, establish the validation, the unequivocal proof that what we're doing is helping people. So that's how we, we, we see this complementarity playing out. In both the top medical journals and popular science articles of recent years, Eric has been contemplating a future of personalized healthcare and has detailed the areas of medicine where new technologies are having their biggest impact. Well, there's so many, uh, it's almost endless, but the ones that are right here and now are really pretty striking. So, uh, for example, the ability to diagnose diabetic retinopathy. So, of all the people with diabetes, more than half never get screened, and it's a preventable form of blindness, a leading form, if not the leading form of blindness. So, the fact that you could have a receptionist in a doctor's office now, FDA approved, uh, obtain the exam and it be analyzed by an algorithm, we can start to see all patients with diabetes get screened and ideally prevent that form of blindness. Another one that's pretty cool is for people with kidney disease, we're worried about their potassium getting too high, which can be lethal. But now there's ability for on a smartwatch, without any blood, get your continuous potassium level in your blood through your uh, deep learning algorithm. They, there's a, there's an amazing number of these that are coming uh, into play now, but things that the doctors would have so that, for example, your scans can be automatically read with high speed, high accuracy at low cost to if you have a colonoscopy, you're, the polyps that would be missed by the gastroenterologist are not missed by machine vision. So any way you can think of it, there's impacts that are starting to be seen. It really is amazing. I think in one of your earlier books, uh, you referenced the printing press as being instrumental in terms of democratizing you know, information. So what do you think the progress has been like so far in democratizing medicine with these technologies? And um, yeah, what challenges remain going forward in terms of either the technology itself or just implementation? Well, the democratization was made possible when everything started to get digitized and data became eminently portable, transferable. The, the obstacle to that democratization are actually doctors yeah. because they are not so keen about sharing all their data, like the notes, or accepting that when patients generate their own data, that that's perfectly fine. Instead, they tend to diss the data. And so we have a problem with lack of control, the level playing field being widely accepted. We're still in the uh, throes of trying to overturn paternalism yeah. in medicine. But once we get there, which is inevitable because all this data is so portable and a lot of it is being generated in non-traditional paths by the people who have sensors that goes to their phone with algorithms completely bypassing the normal classical doctor orders a test, doctor right. orders this or that. And it's their doctor's data where it should be the person's data. So when we get to the point that people own their own medical health data, then we'll have made real progress. You know, this is something where, where digitization of all health and medical data led to this 
democratization. The third D, which is the deep learning phase, which is now we're, we're going to have all this data. What are we going to do with it? Now, fortunately, at the right time, we have a form of artificial intelligence that's well equipped to deal with this data. What do you think about the way medical training has to change? I mean, is this being incorporated now into the way doctors get trained or is this still a major obstacle? This is a really big area because firstly, there are no medical schools that have artificial intelligence in their curriculum, no less a digital medicine and sequencing each of the students' genomes, for example. A lot of the new things in medicine haven't been incorporated into the curriculum, but there's another big issue here, which is the type of, of people we'd want to be doctors in the future. Uh, yeah. Because we don't need brainiacs. We don't need people with perfect uh, MCAT scores and perfect uh, GPAs because AI is going to help. It's going to augment human performance. Yeah. So what you really need is to have people with the utmost empathy, communicative skills, the, the ones that really want that interhuman bond and the mm -hmm. trust and the presence and that's something that we should aspire to now. This is really our chance to take that relationship, which was once precious, more than 40 years ago or more, to bring it back, to use the future to bring back the past. Yeah, yeah it's almost a double-edged sword because we have the amazing power of these digital technologies for helping with you know, diagnostics and medicine. Then on a, in a personal sense, it almost makes us a bit more socially isolated as well sometimes. Yes, well, there is no question yeah. about this loneliness factor. Right. Uh, and that's what we have to get over because in the machine era, as they get better and better with this remarkable power of AI, it's up to us mm. to become more human and to be bonded more and to basically, uh, that's what separates great medicine from the way it's eroded over these years. It really has taken hits. There's very little time between a, a doctor, a clinician, and a patient. And also, obviously, keyboard that get in the way. They're uniformly hated by both doctors and patients. And we can get rid of them totally and liberate uh, this from you know interference and distraction. But we got to really enhance that bond because when you're sick, that's what you really need. Nursing is a very caring degree. So do you think maybe their role will be enhanced even more with I, the application of these technologies? I, I do think nurses will be vital mm. because they, it naturally breeds people who are empathetic and, and caring. But they, too, have had a compromise in their ability to do that because they're, they've got keyboards. Sure. They've got all sorts of administrative stuff. Yeah. They have peak disenchantment, burnout, depression. We've got to come up with a remedy for that. And we're looking right at it in plain sight, but we've got to invest in it and accelerate it so we can stop having nurses, doctors, and all the other clinicians questioning why they went into this field. Right. Do you find, because I know you like to tweet a lot, do you find you have to moderate the time you spend on digital devices? You know, because it's very addictive. Yeah, well, I use Twitter because I read a lot. Uh, I'm kind of an info addict. So I like to share what I read. Uh, and if everybody shared, uh, and Twitter's a great platform for that, that we all get smarter faster. It doesn't take me much time because I read this stuff anyway. And I often enjoy learning from others as well. To me, it's not really social media. It's science media. Mm. It's a way to exchange what I'm learning and what other people are also who I respect, what they're learning. And it's very efficient. I mean, I can spend relatively short time putting out some tweets and reading what others are putting out, and then carry on with whatever else I'm doing. I find it a great way to break up things, you know, in between a meeting or if I'm writing and I need to take a break from what I'm writing or I'm editing or I'm whatever. It's a distraction from something when I need a break. That's cool. Yeah, I know a lot of scientific PIs like to use it for referencing as well, like a key figure. They'll just like quickly share it and it's kind of pinned then. Actually, you're funny you mentioned that. I, I use the archive of all the tweets. Now really? I've got about yeah, 18,000. That's how I find everything. So uh, I, I just have to search the word or the hashtag or whatever I'm looking for, and I find it you know right away. And so it's actually become my number one archive yeah. Uh, resource. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, it's a nice, a nice aspect. Keep, the, keep Twitter for the scientific ideas and then the socializing actually in, in real life. Yeah, I mean, I think we don't, we don't share enough. I'm very big into open science, open data, open everything. Yeah. You know, and 
uh, I wish more people were into it. And then on the health side, any personal anecdotes there? Like, do you use a Fitbit or have these digital technologies uh, aided your health and well-being? Well, I try everything before I would recommend to a patient. So whether it's a glucose sensor or blood pressure smartwatch or uh, I use a lot of smartphone ultrasound. Oh, okay. Every patient I see as a cardiologist, I use a smartphone ultrasound to do their heart exam. Oh. I haven't used a stethoscope in about eight years. <laughs> So um, it's remarkable because I see everything. And and I see the heart, every aspect of the heart, the valves, the heart muscle, the size of the chambers, and I share it with the patient. And it's so instructive. It makes love dub of the stethoscope like a joke. Yeah, It's a totally obsolete piece of equipment. So that's my favorite app, and I use that every, every time I'm seeing a patient. And I also, you know, carry it with me because it's invaluable with respect to, you, you can... You can image any part of your body except your brain. Mm. Or if somebody is sick and, and, you, and you're asked to help assess them, you've got that, you know, to be able to pull it out and do something. Yeah, and the way these apps are designed, they're so user-friendly, it must, it must give the patient a lot better understanding of what's actually going on and, and improve that bond then with the doctor. Well, that's the, that's the uh, example of technology enhancing humanity. Yeah. If I were to sh- have you listen to your heart, you wouldn't know what that means. Yeah. Uh, it would sound like a washing machine or something. <laughs> but if I show you your pictures and send you your video loop so you can look at it later and show all your family and friends and whatnot, that's really, it's about you and, and, and you're learning from that. Yeah. And so when someone has a, a very thick heart muscle and they have high blood pressure, it helps them motivate to get a better handle on their blood pressure, for example. Yeah. So I, I do think visualization is a really important part of of healthcare, and we need to promote that. So maybe we could wrap up by talking about the new book. I know you alluded to it a bit earlier, but maybe you could give us the title. I know it's soon to be released. So yeah, what are the key messages and how does Scripps research actually fit into that future that you outlined? Well, I'm hoping that Scripps research will be the lead uh, uh, for deep medicine. Deep medicine, uh, as I mentioned, is this three layers of depth. It's the phenotyping, understanding each human being at unprecedented granular level. It's the ability to have deep learning of that data because otherwise we couldn't deal with it so we can basically crystallize it and, and prevent, for the first time, fulfill a dream, prevent illness, prevent conditions. And then the third part, to me, the most far-reaching is to establish deep empathy mm-hmm. and restore the care in healthcare. So that's what it's about. But the reason why I think we can lead this charge is that because we we have a significant period of time establish ourselves as uh, both a leader in informatics, in digital devices, and in genomics. So we have all the pieces that are here. And so what we need to do is keep building on it, work with partnerships, collaborations, uh, all sorts of means to amp it up. That's something I think we will strive for uh, as long as I'm here and as long as our institution uh, is uh, working in this space. Yeah, it's very inspiring and it's, uh, it's a real honor actually to be, to be part of that vision. So speaking of inspiration, where do you find you get a lot of your writing inspiration from? And do you have a specific favorite uh, science or non-science authors? Oh, well, the science authors, uh, no question, I have some favorites. Um, you know, my favorite physician authors are Sid Mukherjee, oh. who wrote The uh, Emperor of All Maladies That's and The great. Gene, and also uh, Abraham Verghese, who wrote Cutting for Stone. And he wrote the foreword for Deep Medicine. Yeah. And he's the leading medical humanist, uh, as far as I'm concerned, in the world. I read a lot of books about AI for uh, deep medicine mm-hmm. research. Uh, one of my favorites, actually, was with Gary Kasparov, the famous uh, grand chess master who was the first human uh, champion to lose to a machine. Right. And D- this was, of course, at the time, a, a monumental event. And he wrote a wonderful book, uh, Deep Thinking. And so, you know, I find many books like that where people tell their stories, just so inspirational. Mm-hmm. And if you can take storytelling with biomedical information or tech information, that starts to get really uh, um, inspirational to me. Yeah, you must be a fast reader then. I read fast. Uh, it's a big advantage. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I've just, it's been groomed over, you know, all these decades. Yeah. I've always loved to read, but over the years, it just became uh, even more passionate uh, about it than ever. 
Me too. I'm usually reading nonfiction, but I'm kind of a slow reader, so I need to improve my reading technique. Well, you might invest in some of that. <laughs> yeah. uh, there are ways to do it I've heard. because if you if you read uh, faster and don't lose on your comprehension side, yeah. um, you you just feel like you're getting that much more done. And give and some people really love audio audio books, uh, and they, it goes fast. Uh, so that's another good way to do it. I mean, I, I haven't gone that route, but a lot of my friends have increasingly moved to audiobooks, uh, which is interesting, and my wife. Um, but podcasts are obviously really big. I wonder why. <laughs> and uh, that's another great way. What my concern is that people don't read as much these days. Mm. And uh, I hope we get back to reading. One of the interesting things is everyone predicted that ebooks were going to take over and the Kindle was going to reign supreme. And what we've seen is a complete throwback to physical books. It's so funny you say that because about a year ago, or maybe longer now, I bought a Kindle, mostly for the convenience of traveling. And I don't like it. I haven't yeah. used it. Yeah. In about a year, I've gone back to books. It's exactly. It's something I, so much nicer about the physical the, book. The only thing I like about the ebook is the ability to uh, find things in it uh, right. in searching. But otherwise, I just like a physical book. Well, I, I think that just about wraps things up. So maybe my last question and most important, perhaps, of the day, which is when your book does come out, can you sign my copy? Oh, I'd be pleased to do it. <laughs> Absolutely. Great. And when's the release date? March 12th. March 12th. Okay, I look forward to it. I'll try and read faster. <laughs> get, <laughs> get ready for it. Well, thank you. All right, thanks so much, Eric. Sure, sure. <laughs> there you have it, folks. What an inspirational episode and a truly exciting time for medicine. I'm really grateful to my guest, Eric, for joining me again on the show. And if people enjoyed this one, then maybe we can get him back on next year for the latest updates in this fast-moving field. In the show notes, you can find links to the Translational Institute, Eric's upcoming book, and his social media handles, so be sure to check those out. And if you've got a minute, remember to leave that wonderful review and hit subscribe. And there's more great stuff in the works, including discussions of neurodegenerative diseases and regenerative medicine. So don't be a stranger. Check back soon for updates. Thanks for listening, everyone, and be well.